Well, now uh, we are attending COP27. Uh, we know that Finland has pioneer um, programs towards uh, green solutions. How can this be shared with the whole world, especially with the underdeveloped countries, um, in light of the financial crisis, uh, geopolitical uh, warfare, and what do you think can Finland provide the world during this time? Well, of course, we know that there are so many and so huge problems ahead of us, and I think the biggest one is, of course, climate change, the loss of biodiversity that we all need to work on. And I'm glad that we are here at COP27 to fight these changes that we are seeing in climate. But of course we need the commitment of all countries to do their part because none of us can do it ourselves. We need cooperation and we need togetherness and we need uh, common solutions. Finland aims to be climate neutral already by 2035. That's very early. It's it's only uh, over 10 years from now, so we have very ambitious targets and we are also working on it. Uh, and the way that we are working to fighting climate change is actually cooperation. Cooperation between public sector, private sector, NGOs in, in third uh, sector. So we need cooperation more. And of course we can also provide solutions. And I think it's our responsibility as developed countries to also provide solutions for those that needs them. Uh, for example, new technologies, digitalization, uh, new technologies also to create uh, cleaner and more sustainable energy and energy storage uh, and also the networks. So it's our responsibility to work together. Yes, of course. As a prime minister, you had a cabinet mostly uh, of women. Your country is very progressive towards gender equality and women's rights. In, 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 in such a world, when you see what's happening in Iran, for instance, towards women, the, uh, the repression, uh, what do you think and, and, and how can Finland, have, do you have a stand towards what's happening in Iran towards women? Well, of course we have a stand. It's wrong what is happening uh, to civilians in, in Iran. Women, girls, people that are peacefully protesting are attacked it's not right and we are of course condemning all violations against peaceful protesters and we are standing beside Iranian women and we want of course justice for women and girls everywhere. The Finnish uh, government uh, is led by five women. We have uh, party leaders in, in five different parties that are all women and four of us are young women and also mothers. So. So we are working together and, and trying to build the, the society more equal, respectful of human rights and also uh, very progressive. Mm -hmm. uh, Finland has one of the most advanced educational systems, not just in Europe, but in the world. How can you share your experience with the Arab world? Do you provide uh, scholarships? Can you uh, exchange any of your expertise with the Arab world, do you have such programs? Well, of course, it's very smart to invest in education. Actually, Finland was very poor agrarian culture, country just over 100 years ago. And we built our society, the welfare state that it is now, uh, based on education, that we put money to our children and it paid off. So I think uh, putting money and invest in education is crucially important. It's important for the big challenges that we have ahead of us, such as climate, loss of biodiversity and other challenges. We need education, we need innovative solutions, we need new technologies uh, and innovations to tackle all this. But it's also so smart when you look at the societies, when you put money in education, then it really pays off for high quality jobs, for better income to people, to, to make sure that you have the abilities to export the goods that you can provide. So I think it's so smart to put your money to education. And of course we want to help also. And we have many projects with many uh, different kind of countries, also developing countries, uh, to building them their educational systems. Uh, and there are many things that, that the world can learn from Finland. Yes, of course. With the energy crisis, of course, due to the Russian-Ukrainian war, uh, there's an energy crisis facing Europe 
to what extent is this energy crisis uh, affecting Finland and do you have any other alternatives? Well, it affects Finland uh, mainly uh, through the high energy prices. Actual, actually, we are next door neighbor to Russia, but because of that we have been preparing uh, for a long time. So we are not as dependent on Russian fossil fuels as many other European countries are. So we have been preparing, but the high energy prices, it also affects our society, our citizens, our companies, our businesses. So we have to tackle two issues. First is to make sure that we will invest in renewables, that we will cope not only this winter, but the upcoming winters when it comes to electricity or heat. And then we need to make sure that the high prices are put down. So this is something that we are working together on European Union, on European Council, how we can make sure that we can cut the high energy prices and also that way to tackle Russia and not giving it the leverage that it's using now uh, to, to blackmail Europe throughout energy. Okay, Russian-Ukrainian war also had made a crisis in food chains. Um, are there any solutions that you are suggesting towards this crisis? Well, we need to end the war. We need to make sure that the war ends because it impacts different countries in so many levels. Of course, Ukrainians that are now in war, they are losing life of innocent people every day. Uh, but also others, Europe throughout energy and the world throughout food. We are seeing uh, severe uh, issues concerning food security because Russia is blocking, for example, the Ukrainian wheat uh, to go outside of the country. So, so it affects different countries in so many ways. And we need to make sure that the war ends and we are helping Ukraine every way we can to putting more heavy sanctions on Russia, to making sure that Ukraine is provided with weaponry, for example, humanitarian aid, also financial aid. And then, of course, we are welcoming the refugees from, from Ukraine to our countries to make sure that they will have a better life. Are you ready to face any re Russian reaction towards your application to join the NATO? I mean, uh, so far, did you anticipate or what is the Russian um, uh, reaction? Is it uh, anticipated by you? Do you think it will be escalated in the near future? towards Finland? Well, of course, we are prepared in different kind of scenarios. There isn't any acute threat, for example, military threat against Finland or Sweden that, that both of our countries decided to join NATO because of the Russian aggression against Ukraine. Uh, but of course, we are prepared in many kinds of, of influencing, such as using uh, cyber attacks or informational warfare. We are seeing uh, also false information throughout out online being spread it. So of course we are expecting or not expecting that, but we are pre we are uh, preparing from different kind of scenarios. Good. So after applying to join the NATO, do you feel does Finland feel more secured? Do you have assurances that you are protected? Well, we are joining because we need uh, we need of course, the Article 5 protection. We need to make sure that, that Russia wouldn't enter our border. There isn't any acute threat, as I said before, but still we want to make sure that also in the future this will be the case that Russia would have uh, this kind of threat, the Article 5 under NATO, that said that other countries will come to the aid if some country is uh, violated uh, and attacked. So, of course, this is the main reason that we are joining NATO. And we wouldn't have this discussion in Finland or in Sweden if Russia wouldn't at attack Ukraine. This is because of the war. This is because of Russia's aggression towards its neighbor. And Finland has a long border with Russia, 1,300 kilometers. So, of course, we want to make sure that, that what is happening today in Ukraine wouldn't happen in Finland ever again. Of course. How did you view the Turkish refusal for you to join the NATO? I mean, how do you view that? Well, of course, we are waiting Turkey to ratify Finland's and Sweden's application for NATO, and also Hungary hasn't yet uh, ratified. But I have uh, spoken briefly with, with President Erdogan, and, and he has told that the same thing that he has said also in public, that there isn't uh, that big problems with Finland. 
there are some issues that he wants to discuss with Sweden, but of course we are in it together with Sweden and we are hoping that Turkey and Hungary will ratify as soon as possible. Well, the Turkish side accused you of harboring uh, terrorists from the Kurdish uh, opposition and separatists. Well, did you take any actions? I don't think that the issue concerning uh, terrorism isn't so much with Finland than it is with Sweden. So we didn't, for example, change our legislation and, and we don't accept any kind of terrorism in Finland. Okay, how do you explain the U.S. position having uh, U.S. as an ally and they understand how crucial it was for you to join the NATO and they could have uh, uh, talked to, uh, to Ankara uh, because they do have communication and coordination. What you, how do you explain the U.S. The US position? in not interfering or not talking to the, t the Turk side? I don't think it's my position to explain U.S. position. I think they can, of course, answer themselves. But we are working very closely with, with different allies. And, of course, the United States are uh, a good ally to Finland and has been also before the NATO application. Okay. Moscow threatened recently to retaliate in due course to NATO's, NATO's military bases in Finland. How do you view this threat and are you ready for such a threat to have military bases from the NATO in Finland? Well, at this stage, we are, of course, hoping to get into NATO as soon as possible to be full members. Uh, and this is what we are focusing on. I think it's important that we don't close any doors for the future from different kind of solutions. As, and we have in Finland very good parliamentary and cooperation um, and it's it's cooperation between the government and also the opposition. We have a consensus when it comes to foreign and security policy. And we also have this process of, of building foreign and security policy papers together with the whole parliament, with the president, with the government. And this would be a process where we could discuss these kind of matters in the future. But right now it's important that we will get into NATO and then we can discuss these matters later. Well, you have announced military coordination with, with Sweden, um, which will deter Russia. Can you explain more? Well, of course, we have worked with Sweden uh, and cooperated with Sweden concerning uh, security for a long time. So this isn't new, but of course, the NATO membership of both countries will bring even more depth to the, to the cooperation between Finland and Sweden and the whole uh, part of Northern Europe. How do you view the prospect uh, or the future of this war? The future of the war? Well, of course, we are making everything we can that the war would end as soon as possible. And it's not our place to say, uh, outsiders' place to say how the war should end. I think it's the decision that the Ukrainians themselves must make what are the conditions that they could agree on, and we need to support them in their decision-making. This is very important that we don't uh, try to operate above them, but, but to support them, that they can make their own decisions. Our interview comes uh, very few days after you, uh, you were recently cleared of misconduct due to the, uh, the party that went viral, the video that went viral. How did you take the decision and how did you take the whole thing? Well, I think it's the audience to decide. Uh, these videos weren't meant to be public, of course. It was my private life and, I, of course, I wasn't very happy to see this in media. But I think it's we live in democracy and people have the right to vote. We have elections next spring and, and then they can decide how they are seeing, for example, this, these issues. Uh, of course, I didn't do anything to harm the, the position of, of Prime Minister. It was my free, free time with my friends. And I think dancing is a good way to spend your free time. <laughs> so it will not change your lifestyle? No, I, I, I think it's also very important that us politicians, we are still humans. Uh, and, and I want to stay who I am and not to change myself because of the position. I think also that people appreciate that you are who you are and then you tell honestly, this is me and you can vote for me if you want, you can vote for the party, but you don't have to. It's democracy.
Well, you uh, were the youngest uh, prime minister in the history of Finland. You uh, took your position uh, back in 2019. You were only 34 years old and you had so many awards, many um, 100 uh, strongest women, as Forbes said. But there was one, uh, one description in the Bild, German newspaper. You were described as the coolest prime minister in the world. Do you like this uh, being the coolest? Uh, I mean, how do you view this? How do you view yourself? Well, I don't focus on myself. I focus, of course, the issues that we have in our table, the, all the big, big um, crises that we have had during our governmental period. First, uh, COVID, the pan global pandemic, then the war in Europe, now the energy crisis, maybe upcoming uh, economical crisis as well. So my hands are full uh, of, of handling these issues and making sure also that we are prevail um, providing uh, and, and making uh, our governmental program a reality. So I have my hands full of the job, so I don't focus on myself and, and try not to focus on that.